Hello and welcome to Beacon Hill Update on Frontier Community Access Television. As always, I'm your host, Chris Collins. We are back in studio with a very special guest to talk about a race coming up in the Democratic Party and the race for Governor's Council. But before we get to that, a couple of thoughts on the recently completed state budget process. You know, we spent a lot of time, energy, and effort over the last couple of months talking about the state budget process with various members of the Beacon Hill delegation. We even had Franklin County Sheriff Chris Donlin come in to talk about some of the good work he's been doing at the jail and also with the Franklin County Opioid Task Force. If you've been following the budget process, you know that the governor has spent the better part of a year running around the Commonwealth talking about the importance of fighting the drug epidemic that's been plaguing Western Mass, heroin specifically. He spent a lot of energy talking about it. He's talked about putting great state resources toward it, and he's built a lot of political capital into that effort. He's even been, gone so far as to classify, which few politicians have done, drug abuse as a medical problem rather than a, a crime and punishment problem, which is rare for a Republican governor. Rarer still, though, is a governor that talks about that issue as wholeheartedly as Governor Baker has, and one who vetoes the funding for the Franklin County Opioid Task Force. He also vetoed funding for DA Dave Sullivan's anti-crime unit, which helps fight drug trafficking in Franklin County and the Pioneer Valley. This doesn't make a lot of sense to me. By the time you're watching this, I'm sure the legislature may have already voted to override those vetoes. But how can a man who spends so much time and energy campaigning on behalf of an issue, who talks about it being a clear and present danger to this commonwealth, turn around and veto funding for two programs that are crucial in the fight against drugs? It's baffling, maybe not so baffling for a Republican governor who says one thing and does another. And I certainly hope nobody forgets this in this part of the commonwealth and nobody takes anything that guy says seriously when it comes to the drug issue in Franklin, Hampshire, Hamden, and Berkshire counties. Speaking of the four counties, we have a race for governor's council coming up this fall. It's one of the few elected positions that represent all four western counties. One person who wants to be the next governor's councilor from the 8th district joins me. She's Mary Hurley. She's a former Springfield mayor, retired judge, and Democratic candidate one of two in the primary coming up in September. So I've given you a little bit of your pedigree, Mary, but tell the viewers who you are, where you come from, and why you want this job. Basically, I was a, a five-term city councilor, elected president twice, served two terms as the mayor of Springfield in probably the worst financial times we've seen uh, up through 2008. And um, I also was fortunate enough to be appointed a district court judge for a period of um, 19 and a half years, I served in all of the courts in Western Mass in uh, the Governor's Council District and also um, was first justice of the Chicopee District Court for probably 12 or 14 years. And uh, so I am very familiar with the issues in terms of the opioid crisis, mental health issues, the veterans issues, and all of the other things that are at the forefront of concern in uh, today's uh, communities throughout the district. Uh, and I feel that I have the qualifications uh, to know who can best serve as district court judges, superior court judges, appeals court judges, supreme court judges, as well as clerks of court, uh, parole board members. The other important thing is I experienced firsthand the shortages of judges that occurred uh, over the last um, probably eight years as a result of the downturn in the economy. We used to have 27 judges in this region. Uh, we were down about a third of our workforce. So we have more specialized courts. Who's gonna fill those if we don't get our judges up to where they should be? I did a snapshot in October of 2015. There were 15 vacancies in the state, in the district court. 10 of those 15 vacancies were in Western Mass in our district. Uh, that was of great concern to me, and you know they cut sessions left and right yeah. um, because they didn't have people to fill the chairs. That's got to stop. The other thing is, we've got five new Supreme Court justices. Right. We had at one point two Supreme Court justices from Western Mass: Judge Graney and um, Judge Spina. Judge Graney retired in 2008. Judge Spina is retiring in August. The three nominees that the governor put up. None of them are from Western Mass. Mm. And they were all from the same geographical district in the eastern part of the state. I want to be down there to knock on his door and say, you have to give us somebody from Western Mass. We want a representative who understands our communities and 
I also think it's important that we look at filling these judges' uh, positions and clerks' positions with more minorities, uh, more women, and that we have people who are sensitive to the issues that are at the forefront, including the opioid crisis, um, the domestic violence issues, and um, you know, uh, are supportive of our veterans' courts. We're going to come back to the the vacancies in Western Mass because that's a crucial campaign plank, and there's more to that that we want to get into. But I want to talk about the governor's council itself because I'm not sure a lot of people know what the governor's council does. Charlie Pierce, who's a columnist for Esquire, called it a relic of colonial government, and. So why is the governor's council still important? I mean, what, why should we worry about the people who sit on that, that council? Well, in essence, it's the check and balance that uh, you have between the governor being able to appoint who he wants to appoint without any further approval and having a body there that represents the entire state of Massachusetts with representatives from each of the districts who can speak on behalf of the people in their district and the Commonwealth as a whole. In the Senate, in, when the president makes a nomination, whether it's Supreme Court or one of the f other federal courts, you have the Senate being the body that does the advice and consent. So it's important to have that check and balance. Um, yes, it's been around for a long time. It's certainly not as glamorous as sheriff or district attorney uh, in terms of an important office, but it does fulfill an important function. Um, they also pass on pardons that the governor would um, uh, put before us, and those have to be meritorious as far as I'm concerned. And you don't want anybody not having that check and balance there. Uh, Mark Wahlberg last year or a year and a half ago wanted to um, clear his record so he could get right. a liquor license. His record contained two situations. First of all, he, um, there was a hate crime involving a young black person and then a hate crime involving two young Vietnamese people. This is not the kind of thing where somebody should be able to say, hey, I'm Mark Wahlberg, I want a pardon. Not going to happen if I'm there. The Governor's Council deals with judicial appointments primarily, although you deal with a lot of other appointments. And one of the questions I like to ask candidates for this office is, do you have a litmus test? What kinds of judges would Mary Hurley want to see? I would want to see someone in the position that has the knowledge of the law in that particular area. Um, a lot of these courts are specialized. For example, domestic relations is in the probate court. Juvenile court is all different in terms of care and protection as well as dealing with criminal violations by juveniles. The district court does 90% of the criminal cases. Um, so you gotta have the judges that are knowledgeable in criminal law. They also need to have uh, knowledge in civil law. We also deal with um, an inordinate number of abuse complaints, whether it's harassment complaints or domestic violence complaints. So they have to have a broad range of knowledge. They also, I think, have to have a good demeanor. They have to have a good reputation within their community. And they have to be the kinds of people that have patience. They, they're patient, but yet they're firm and they are uh, able to render fair and just decisions. They also have to take into account the issues concerning diversion for opioid situations, uh, veterans, um, those courts are there for a reason. We have a mental health court in Springfield. Mm -hmm. That's there for a reason. Somebody who's suffering from mental illness shouldn't necessarily be in jail. There should be ways to divert that into treatment. So they've got to be sensitive to the needs of the community. Uh, I think that they um, need to also um, have uh, an idea as to fundamental fairness and they have to have patience. You have no idea the number of pro se litigants in the courts today, whether it's in divorce court or looking for custody situations to be resolved, or in the district court where you have uh, a lot of people who want to represent themselves. What do you stand on activist judges? I mean, there's different kinds of judges. There's a judge that just basically sticks to the law as it's written, and then there are activist judges who sort of want to go the extra step. They want to they want to put their mark on the law or change the law in some way. Do you feel like that's the right person for the bench? I think that the person who sits on the bench is there to administer justice according to the, the law that is presently in existence, and they apply the law to the facts as they determine them to be. Um, to have somebody to kind of go off on a tangent one way or the other, I don't think it's healthy. It 
frustrates the expectations of the people who come before them for justice. It frustrates the lawyers in terms of this is the expectation I have, this is what the law says, and you can't go off on a tangent. Uh, in terms of the Supreme Court and the Appeals Court, they're there to interpret the Constitution. The Constitution is a document in flow in terms of the fact that it was written hundreds of years ago. It's still our guideline, but there are new things that come up all the time. There are issues that come up, for example, in terms of the use of cell phones in evidence, um, the, the use of you know, wiretaps in cell phones, or um, when, you make a, when you have a stop, um, now that marijuana is legal, you know, it, there's a whole broad, there's new areas. Yeah, there's a bunch of case law that hasn't even been written yet. Exactly, and those are different situations where you have judges can hear the same set of facts and come out on different sides. Right. And that's what you have appeals courts and the Supreme Court for. Well, I guess that's why I, I'm curious about that, because there, it, there, there does seem to be a lot of issues, a lot of them are pegged around privacy, where we just haven't had a challenge yet. And those challenges are going to come before, essentially, a brand new Supreme Judicial Court. Absolutely. And that's why you have to have people who are well-versed uh, in the law. Uh, each of the people that have been nominated by the governor, um, although none from Western Mass, yeah. Um, they are all, I think, very well versed in the law and in, in especially in criminal law. And I would indicate to you that unfortunately now um, the floodgates are wide open on criminal issues, yeah. much more so than civil issues. Uh, if you look at any advance sheets, you might have 10 or 12 criminal cases and maybe two civil cases. So. Um, you know, you need the people with the experience in the background. The other thing is, in terms of um, their experience in the courts, there are evidentiary issues that are, are appealed all the time. And you need people who have that kind of experience. Um, you don't want somebody operating on your brain if they've never done right. an operation. So uh, I would say the same thing is true. Um, in terms of the people that you have on the Supreme Court. They need to have experience, a broad range of experience. And we also need some civil people there too, which you know, uh, I think we have a few people. Um, and we gotta look to balance those things out. The thing about the governor's council though, it's, it's largely a reactionary body. I don't, I don't think necessarily the governor comes to you guys and says, okay, what do you think about this nominee or that nominee? I mean, you have to sort of take the nominees he gives you, or, or is, am I wrong about that? Well, what happens is there's, there's a process where you make an application. Part of the application is a blind application. That goes before the Judicial Nominating Committee. One of the other things I'm gonna knock on Charlie Baker's door about is there's only two representatives from Western Mass. Yeah. I'd like to see more representatives there, or go back to the old style where you had a, governor, a Judicial Nominating Committee for Western Mass, Central Mass, and Eastern Mass. Those are the kinds of things that, you know, get to the community much uh, more in depth than if you've got people down in Boston having meetings down there. So first you go to the Judicial Nominating Committee, then those people are vetted. Uh, out of maybe 40 applications, you might have 12 or 15 people that are interviewed. Out of those interviews, usually you have three that are nominated or proposed for the governor for nomination. And then the governor vets them further with uh, the joint bar committee and then uh, chooses, um, and there's also the state police investigate sure. you. Um, you know, there's, there's all kinds of background, of, right? Exactly, yeah, yeah. a lot of background checks. So when they get to the governor's council, um, they have been vetted and the governor's council I think is there um, for the most part um, just to double check and make sure and sometimes you know, until it's announced, until it's made public, there are people out there that may know something very important about a candidate, but nobody's heard about it yet. Mm -hmm. So I think that that is the important step that takes place. And I think also that the, the fact that, you know, um, they have an opportunity to say, oh, this person is nominated? Well, you may not know this, but um, I think it's important to have that last step. And, and the thing is, it's, it's such a political process because, you know, you don't get to be a judicial nominee without having 
some kind of a connection somewhere, either to the governor or to someone close to him or to a legislator. So, you know, the guy that, or the woman that may be coming in front of you may look good on paper politically, but maybe there's some stuff there that maybe we don't know about that the governor's council is the last line of defense on. Exactly. I can remember the state police um, interviewed me, they interviewed my neighbors, and, um, you know, back then, 20 years ago, it was like, uh, well, did you ever beat your husband? I said, only on the golf course. <laughs> so, but that's, that's serious. I mean, domestic violence yeah. sometimes is hidden. A gambling problem sometimes is hidden. Sure. They should be vetted financially. They should be vet vetted in terms of the reputation in the community. And I'll tell you, from my experience, if somebody's nominated, I'm going to go to that court and I'm going to ask the court officers and the people in the clerk's office, how does this man or woman treat you? Yeah, the temperament is important. Temperament mm -hmm. is huge. Um, their reputation as an attorney uh, for, for truth and for, uh, you know, just having uh, um, honor and respect for other people. Uh, those, are, those are all things. If, if I'm a judge and I don't respect the people that come in front of me, how bad is that? That sends the wrong message to those people who are there for their day in court. Yeah, and, and you can tell a lot about a person by how they treat their staff. Exactly. And, and, and so that, that makes a lot of sense. I want to go back to something you touched on earlier because I think it's really important, and that's the bench vacancy issue. I mean, it's no secret that Western Mass often gets short shrift on a right. lot of things. And we, I mentioned at the top about the vetoes, and uh, this governor gave every indication that he understood the needs of the West up until, I think, the most recent budget round, and he's been sending Karen Polito out here pretty regularly. He was also, by the way, an ex officio member of the governor's council as a lieutenant governor. Correct. Um, but the bench vacancies, I mean, how does a governor's counselor change that, other than screaming at the governor and getting in his face and threatening to withhold support for his nominees? What, what can you do to change that? Well, you go to the administration uh, in the trial court. Paula Carey's the, the head uh, administrative judge. Uh, Harry Spence is there as an administrator, and you say to them, you don't understand. I can tell you from personal experience. When I was in Chicopee District Court, they cut my jury judge. They wanted to take the jury cases out of Chicopee and put them in Springfield. I said, no, you're not, because we're going to get lost in the shuffle, yeah. and you're inconveniencing the victims on cases, the police officers, the witnesses, and I'm going to have to give up a probation officer for a whole day you know, to be down there. So they said, well, what are you going to do? I said, I will decrease the number of people in the primary session, and I'm going to do the jury cases and the primary session myself. So I ran back and forth every, every a month. A lot of work. Okay. Ran back and forth, called the two lists. Uh, fortunately, a lot of cases fold the day of the jury trial for pleas. Um, they resolve, you know, heard the bail cases, heard whatever else was going on. Um, but it, it, it delayed the trials. And instead of being able to get two trials done when there were two judges there, we only got one done. And sometimes it carried over till the next day. I had to apologize to the jurors, yeah. okay, because they had to come back. Right. And justice delayed is justice denied. So, I was just going to say that that was the, the, you, when you said that when, uh, last time we spoke. I, that always stuck in my head. Yeah, it's and it's so true. People, you know, they expect when they're called to go to court to testify or to serve on a jury that everything's gonna run smoothly. And that's just not the case when there's these kind of shortages. It just doesn't happen. Yeah. Um, this is an unusual position because it represents all four Western counties. Right. Um, and I don't know if many people in our area or in, in, in New Hampshire probably they know you a little bit better, but your, your base of support, your base of, of name recognition is in Hamden County, which is the largest voting block in the district. But how, what kind of a, of a guarantee will you make to the more rural counties that you're not going to pull a Richie Neal and not ever be around? Oh, Could... I've been up, I've been into Northampton, I've been up here in Greenfield uh, for various events, I've been up in the Berkshire, as a matter of fact, I'm going to the uh, North Adams tonight yeah. to go to the beach party. They actually fill a whole street with sand. <laughs> I know, it's crazy. And well, as far so from the beach as you can get, but that's they do where it. I'm going to be. Yeah. Um, I, and. The thing is, I love to come out to these communities. I sat in Greenfield District Court. I know the culture out here is so different. I sat in Orange District Court. I've sat in Northampton District Court. Uh, I've sat up in the Berkshires. Uh, it's, you know, each court has its own culture. Uh, 
based on what the community is all about. And I think that's one of the things that I want to make sure that the district court judges have a, a, a recognition of. Um, so that in Orange, they actually charge people who didn't return their video rentals. I know that. I know that. Okay. Yeah. And in, in Springfield District Court, they would have said, go pound sand, because we don't <laughs> have time right. for this. We're doing you know, serious assault and battery cases and domestic violence things and drug cases and what have you. So you know, there's a whole different culture that you have to adapt to as a judge. Uh, and I think that's really critical and important. And the culture is always changing, and, and the, the issues facing judges are always changing. And you mentioned before the, the issue of, of drugs and the, the opioid addiction. And now we have a drug court out here. Right. So you're going to have, uh, probably if you're elected, you're probably going to have to advise and consent on those kinds of judges as well. There, the judges that are going to be doing that will also be doing other types of court cases. Um, those are monitoring on a weekly basis, you know, the mental health court. I sat in the mental health court. I know what that's all about. And I know um, the importance of having that kind of court. And you have dual diagnosis people who have the drugs and the mental health issues who need treatment. They need to be, you know, I, I've sat on civil commitments to put people away for 30 or 60 or 90 days with drug problems, with mental health issues. Uh, I've gone to uh, Bay State Medical Center and sat on hearings as to whether or not someone should uh, have to take medication that they don't want to or they're refusing to take, Rogers hearings. So. Uh, I've, I've been pretty well versed in what goes on in, in all the different aspects of the courts for a long period of time. And I, I think it's important that the people we put on the bench know about all that. And they're sensitive to those issues. Would you say you have a, a legislative agenda? What I mean by that is um, the guy you will succeed if you're elected, Michael Albano, uh, recently pushed, I was reading his website, and he pushed for a bill that would prevent female strip searches in, in jails. Is there a series of bills, or, or would you be, as a governor's counselor, averse to talking to the delegation and, and advocating on behalf of certain types of legislation related to the courts? I, I would um, talk to the delegation. As a matter of fact, in starting to run for this office, I've met with the state reps, the state senators, I've met with um, the mayors, I've met with members of the council, school committees, uh, all over the district, and uh, I basically have told them this is my cell phone number, you've got an issue, you come see me. I will support things, not just the, the legislation relative to the courts, but if Deerfield or Greenfield has some type of project that they need a little help to move the governor in the right direction, I am more than willing to advocate, whether it's Greenfield, Greenfield Community College, the arts, whatever it happens to be, that's going to um, positively affect that community. Uh, and that's been the message that I've delivered uh, wherever I've gone. I've met with the sheriffs, uh, I've met with the different elected officials, and I think it's important that you keep those lines of communication open. And so you're again, not just going there for one Wednesday, you know, at one no, day a week. You, you no. view this as a full-time job kind of thing? or uh, I, I'm retired, <laughs> so yes, it's a full-time job. I'm certainly not doing it you know, for the salary. As a matter of fact, um, way back when I issued a press release, there was a, a raise I wasn't even aware of because I just yeah, looked online. I just found statute. out about that myself. I didn't know about it either until I saw it. And so I said, well, when I decided to run, this was the, the salary. So the $10,000 raise, I indicated that I'm going to put a scholarship fund together oh, great. for people who are going into the criminal justice field. That's good. That's, that's nice of you to do that. Um, speaking of, of working with the governor, I mean, does the fact that you come from politics, that you were a Springfield mayor, which is, I mean, that's the ultimate political seat in Western Mass, a biggie. Uh, does the fact that you held that kind of an office and you worked on city council affairs and that you, you were a politician before you were a judge, does that allow you, you think, an advantage to dealing with a guy like Baker? I know the ropes. I've been down there. I've met with the governor. I've met with the Speaker of the House. I've met with the Senate President. When I was mayor, we brought boatloads, busloads of people down to lobby for certain um, financial help because the city was literally drowning in debt. Yeah, you had a real problem down there for a while. Yeah, I, I walked in the door and six weeks later I laid off 850 people. Oh, that's rough. So, um, you know, we, we kept afloat barely, but I did keep us afloat. No financial crisis, no control board. 
Um, and we had a clean as a whistle administration, no kind of scandal or, you know, nobody had their pocket in, in or their hand in anybody's pocket. Uh, and that's the kind of operation I ran. Uh, I know the ins and outs down there. I'm familiar with a lot of, some of the state reps are, are still, you know, from, yeah. from my era back when. And I've also met with and, and become friendly with a lot of the, the newer ones. So uh, I'm looking forward to working with all of them and um, getting input from all of them. And as I said, I offered to help as an extra voice for Western Mass on any projects that, that they're interested in pushing. One final thought, your opponent wants to debate in all four counties. Why not debate Jeff Morneau? I have debated him. Oh, you have? Okay. Oh, yeah. Um, we did a debate in Springfield in Ward 4. Um, we did a debate um, up in um, Goshen. Uh, we did a debate um, in, oh no, we have a debate scheduled in Holyoke. We have a debate um, on the TV, uh, like your TV down here, the one, the cable station down in Springfield, we yes. did a debate in Wilbraham that was also broadcast. So you're not ducking him. I think that oh, was no, the, that was the all. impression he was he was creating with people was that you weren't you didn't want to debate him. Absolutely not. And you know, the fact of the matter is I'm trying to run a campaign in four districts or four counties. So I have a lot of commitments that I've made. If he wanted to do this, he should have started this back in April mm -hmm. instead of July. So I have commitments that I've got to honor. Um, but every time I've basically been asked and I'm available, I've done it. So, and I'm happy to do it. Well, I know that certainly in Hamden County, you've got the name recognition and it's a short sprint. And, you know, the, the primary is essentially the final because there's no Republican. That's correct. So. And it's also a Thursday, folks, not a Tuesday. It's September 8th. So I hope everybody remembers that. Yep. And I respectfully ask that you consider me as your governor's counselor and give me a vote. Mary Hurley is running for the 8th District seat on the Governor's Council, currently occupied by Michael Albano, who's running for Hamden County Sheriff. She'll be one of two names on that ballot on the primary in September. Thanks for coming in. I appreciate it, Mary. Thank you. A good pleasure. luck in the campaign. Thanks. And that's Beacon Hill Update. Thanks for watching. And for all of us here at FCAT, have a good day.